Hello. Uh, welcome to resiliency testing with Choxy Proxy. Uh, I guess I'll just wait a couple seconds for people to get in. Uh, I'm Jake, and uh, I'm on the infrastructure team at Shopify. And to give you a bit of an idea of uh, who we are, we're an e-commerce company, and we have about uh, half, half a million merchants right now. And so we're, today we're talking about resiliency, and in the world of resiliency, this is the big question, or one of the big questions, which is, how do our applications behave when there are failures in production? And this is a really tough question to answer, and it's tough for a few reasons. Firstly, uh, there's so many different kinds of failure scenarios that it's really hard to, to uh, enumerate them all. And then also, even if we were to focus in on a single kind of failure, it's really hard to tell how our applications will behave, how they'll react to that failure. And that's because we have really, really large code bases. And even if today you know how your application would react to a certain kind of failure, you don't know if next month it's going to react the same way. And that's because our, our code bases are constantly changing. So really what that means is we need tools to help us reason about resiliency. We can't rely on our gut. We can't rely on what we think our applications will do. And so there's a bunch of different kinds of tools we can use to help reason about resiliency. Uh, probably the one you're all familiar with are incidents, that after an incident, you, can, you find out how your application reacts to a certain kind of failure, and that's when you have a chance to improve it. Um, you also have game days. Um, the last speaker spoke a bit about that, right, where you actually can go and cause failures in your application with the hope to exercise certain failure scenarios and see how your, um, make sure your application um, reacts properly. And then there's also kind of chaos engineering type tools, automated chaos engineering tools like Chaos Monkey, where you're automatically causing failures in production. And these are all really important because you can't rely on your gut to understand how your application is going to react. You have to actually exercise it. You actually have to see how it really will react. So if we look at these three tools, we can um, give them a few different qualities. One of the most important qualities for these resiliency reasoning tools is the authenticity of the tool, which basically means how much does it behave like a real production incident. So 0% authenticity would be, for example, maybe a heavily mocked unit test whose behavior is very, very different from a production incident. So production incidents are defined as the 100% the authentic. Game days and chaos engineering are mostly authentic. They're still authentic because you're running in production. But they're less authentic because you have the human creativity in the mix, right? Someone had to write the software uh, for the chaos engineering tools. Someone had to choose what, what commands to run to, to, to have the game day. And so because of that human error factor, they won't be quite as authentic as production incidents. And then with authenticity tends to come production impact. That it tends to be that when you have something that's highly authentic, you also have high production impact. And so that's why you tend to not want to have production incidents as your main form for resiliency reasoning because you're also um, bothering your customers a whole bunch. And so the big advantage to game days and chaos engineering is that they're controlled. So you can write software to control when failures happen and you can hopefully recover more quickly from the failures. And then along with that is automation. And sort of amusingly, production incidents um, are sort of half automated, right? Like the, the failure part's automated. Um, it just tends to be that they, are, they aren't really scheduled at the right time. Um, and then with game days, again, entirely manual, right? Not automated at all. You have to go and run the commands yourself to cause failures in production, and then you have to um, resolve them. And probably of these three chaos engineering, automated chaos engineering tools at least, are, are the most automated. And then another quality sort of entirely different from these last three is what we're going to call accessibility. And accessibility is sort of the, the answer to the question, can all developers use this tool? Uh, the thing is, with production incidents and game days, really you have to know a lot about your production infrastructure to be able to use these tools, right? They're only really accessible to SREs and you know, people who play around in production. You need production access, you need to understand how your production system works. And the big issue with that is that resiliency is a product concern. You have to, uh, you have to know how your users will see failures and all product developers have to um, manipulate the, or, or write code so that when failures happen, 
the products degraded in some way that's, that's good for user experience. So what we can do is we can take these three kinds of uh, resiliency reasoning tools, and they sort of fit on a bit of a timeline. Uh, timeline may be the maturity of your organization, uh, might be a, a way to think of this timeline. When your application first starts off, you're going to have incidents, um, whether you like it or not. But as time goes on, you're going to build a more expensive or more valuable product, and you're going to be concerned with when it actually fails. That's when you're going to start running game days. When when resiliency of your application actually matters from a business concern, then you're actually going to want to start to test out your resiliency features. And then as time goes on, you're going to have less low-hanging fruit, um, less low-hanging fruit to fix, and that's when you want to adopt chaos engineering. That's when um, you can use chaos engineering to start discovering um, weird edge cases in, in um, how your application reacts to failures. And so these are the sort of the three categories of these tools. We have random failures with incidents. Um, game days are really testing hypotheses. You have to know sort of what you're going to test first. You have to say, hmm, I wonder what will happen when we take down this database and um, make this other service slow at the same time. And then you can go and you can try to cause that failure and see how your application reacts to it. Whereas with chaos engineering type tools, you're using it as you're using the tool to discover unknowns. You're using tools to discover you know, some weird edge case failure scenario that you've never seen before. So what I want to focus in on for the rest of the talk is uh, the, the hypothesis testing. And game days are an option for that. Uh, one way to think about um, hypothesis testing is to, to think about this resiliency matrix here. And, um, this resiliency matrix, this is a sort of a, a naive e-commerce app, e application that, that we're, we're um, describing here. And over here on the left side, you have uh, the different services that you can fail, that can fail. In this case, they're all sort of data store type things, but they're theoretically all the different uh, external services your application relies on. And then up top, you have the different sort of features or sections of your application. And these are the customer-facing features that that um, your customers will see as possibly failing. And what the intersection of these two, um, these two things are is effectively how will, how will the customer-facing feature react to a failure in one of these services? So if your MySQL's down, then your checkout will also be down. But if your MySQL's down, your storefront will only be degraded. Um, and I mean, this is obviously a made-up matrix, just, just to explain to you how it works. But effectively, when we're talking about hypothesis testing of resiliency, each of these intersections of the graph, that's effectively your hypothesis. You, you should be looking at this matrix and saying, hmm, I wonder what the matrix is for my application. I wonder what happens when I take this service down. I wonder how that will affect these customer-facing features. There's your hypothesis. And then now you need to go find out actually how your application works by maybe having game days in production. So game days are one option for doing this hypothesis testing. Um, about three years ago, Shopify built uh, another tool um, called ToxyProxy, which is uh, sort of in the same world of, of hypothesis testing, uh, resiliency testing tools. Um, what ToxyProxy is, is you have your application and some sort of a service it talks to. This is all in your test and development environment. And then you put Toxy proxy in between. So your application talks to the proxy, and the proxy, proxy forwards requests to the database. This is all kind of layer four. Um, and then you can tell the proxy to inject failures into the connection. So you can do a few different things. There's a whole bunch of different options, but three of the most common kinds of failures we use, uh, we add latency to the proxy, we black hole data so it never reaches the service, and we reject connections so it's as if the service is down. And where we end up using ToxyProxy uh, is in our test suite. So we've hooked um, a ToxyProxy client library into our test suite. And then we can end up writing tests that look something like this, where we say, hey, ToxyProxy, select the proxy that we're using to connect to MySQL, take it down, and then everywhere between that do and that end, all the code we run there will run as if the MySQL is down. And then as soon as we exit that block at the end, then the proxy will, uh, the, the failure on the proxy will stop and will return back to normal operation. And so 
if we now to fit this, try to fit this idea of toxic proxy back into the resiliency matrix, right? All these services over here, these are the ones that can fail. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be putting our proxy, our toxic proxy, in between these services and our application. So these are going to be proxies. And then at all these intersections of our feature and one of these proxies that we can cause failures on, we're going to write tests. And we're going to write tests that say, hey, cause the failure with this proxy one, with this proxy two, that is a proxy to some service that your application relies on. And then assert behavior about this feature of your application. So uh, for example, proxy two is for MySQL, so we're going to cause a failure with MySQL, and then we're going to write a test that asserts the, on the behavior of checkout. And maybe you, know, you want some sort of a degraded checkout behavior rather than a complete um, failure scenario. So uh, in our core application, we have a few hundred of these, these toxy proxy tests uh, that do all sorts of different things. To give you a bit of an idea of the kinds of things we can do, um, this is one of my favorites. Uh, so we're telling toxy proxy select all proxies. So we're using a little let regex thing to do dot star to select every single proxy by name. And we're taking everything down. So basically, this means inside this block, our application can't access any external services at all. And then we're making sure the application can boot. And this is a really neat test because you, know, you, you obviously don't want your boot process to rely on any external services because if you have any incidents during a deploy or something like that, then, well, who knows what might happen. And what's really cool about this is once you've written this test, this now goes into our test suite and it's now run every time someone deploys to production, which means it'll never regress. And that's really the big advantage over game days, that game days you have to run regularly to know that whatever resiliency feature you're testing, isn't, uh, there's no regression. Uh, another popular um, uh, kind of test that, that we see a lot in our code base are um, when, our, when our data stores have kind of writing capabilities and reading capabilities, we want to make sure that features that rely on the reading, on, on read-only um, data, don't break when the writers are not available. So all we're doing here is we're selecting our database's writer, and we're taking it down, and then we're sending a GET request to some page that should be read-only and making sure that GET request succeeds. And again, we have hundreds of these sorts of tests, but uh, these are a couple of the valuable ones um, that, that we have. So we can go back to the qualities we discussed um, earlier about those three, the three um, kinds of resiliency reasoning tools, right? The production incidents, the game days, the chaos engineering, and we can add toxic proxy down to the bottom there. Um, authenticity is probably the only place where um, it's limited, and that's mainly because we're running in test and development rather than in production. So that just means that the, the range of possible failure scenarios are just so much smaller. Um, the reason it's not red, though, and the reason it's still a valuable tool is because the failure scenarios it does support it supports really well, and it, I would argue it supports quite authentically. Um, it's a proxy that, um, that works, it injects failures at the network level, right? And that's a much better alternative to injecting failures kind of with weird mocks in your test suites, because it tends to be you write mocks wrong, and you don't notice when you're writing your first test, but sometime down the line you realize that you wrote the mock wrong, and it creates some edge case, and you end up having green tests when you actually broke something, and um, that can cause production incidents. Um, in terms of production impact, there's no production impact, right? Because we're running in test and development. So we don't need to worry about that. From an automation point of view, um, we have to remember this is, this is in the category of the hypothesis testing tools, which means you have to know what failure you're going to test before you test it. This won't help you with unknowns. So it's only half automated in that you have to know what test you're going to write and then you need to write that test. You have to say, I'm going to cause a failure with this service. I expect this behavior from some customer-facing feature, and now I'm going to write a test that does this, and then you can run the test and see if it actually behaves that way. Now, once you have the test created, then it's automated, right? In two months, that test is still going to be in your test suite, and someone's going to deploy, when it, and that test will still have to pass before that they can ship any code. Um, and then from an accessibility standpoint, I would argue it's very accessible. And so specifically, if at your company you have a strong testing culture, and um, if you have a good CI system, all you have to do is hook Toxy Proxy into your 
your test suite and teach your developers about the API, which isn't very complicated, right, as we saw earlier. And suddenly you have this really powerful tool that all developers, not just production um, know-how people, can use to test the resiliency of, of their application. So now we're going to go back to the, the timeline we discussed earlier. And now Toxie Proxy is on that timeline. Um, specifically, it's right beside game days, and it's in the category of the testing hypotheses. Um, and it's important to realize that this isn't an alternative to things like chaos engineering. Um, and specifically, it's not an alternative because it doesn't help you with unknowns, that there could be many contrived um, situations where your application can fail that you'll never um, be able to write tests about because you don't know they exist. And so you need some sort of a fuzzy testing um, system to, to catch those. But uh, it's also important to realize that the barrier to entry for Toxie Proxy is much smaller. That if you already have a working test suite and you already have a good CI system, adding Toxie Proxy to that isn't very complicated, at least compared to building um, a tool like Chaos Monkey. So really what it comes down to, uh, applying this sort of tool comes down to understanding the resiliency matrix. So you need to look at this matrix and you have to think, what is the matrix for my application? It's obviously going to be a lot larger than this. Um, and specifically, you want to think um, about how your application is going to behave during different failure scenarios. And you have to sort of say, hmm, I wonder what happens when this service goes down. I wonder how this feature will be re reflected. And once you've made guesses about that, then you want to go and you want to write toxy proxy tests for each of those intersections that basically take your guess and put it into code, and then you can run those tests and see how your application actually behaves. So toxy proxy is an open source project. Uh, you can find it on GitHub, and the readme, there's a really great readme that uh, talks about all sorts of different things and use cases, and um, we have a bunch of different client libraries. Um, we commonly use the Ruby and Go client library, but there's been a bunch of other ones made by the community. Uh, the Ruby client is only about 300 lines of Ruby, so it's super easy to write your own um, if, if you're, you don't see uh, your language of choice up there. So, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>